Hi, my name is Chaser Johnson, and uh, I'm here today with Courtney Richardson. She is uh, she founded the Ivy Investor. Uh, Courtney, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. So yeah, I started the Ivy Investor. Um, I can't believe it's been six years, but I started in 2014. And a lot of people are like, oh, how did you start the Ivy Investor? Well, I kind of followed my friends, if that makes sense. So um, just as a little bit of background, I started in the investment industry in 2003. I became licensed with uh, the Series 7, which is the general securities uh, license. In other words, it's a stockbroker's license. It um, allows me to sell stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, um, and actually options, but there's also an options license, whatever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also had a Series 66, which allows me, um, I think it's like the laws, I forgot the full name of the the uh, license, but it allows me to charge people for my financial advice. And then finally, I had what's a life accident health, which allows me to sell insurance, life insurance, health insurance, um, which a lot of people use as uh, part of their financial plan. So if you haven't guessed, I was a financial advisor uh, right out of college, uh, right out of college, like literally out of college. It was um, interesting. Um, and I hated it. You know, uh, I hated the pay. <laughs> I hated the experience. And the only thing that I got out of it, which I didn't even realize at the time, is that my investment licenses were worth their weight in gold. So I said, okay, well, this is, this is cool. So I ended up getting into banking. And then from banking, banking kind of had like a hybrid kind of spot where I could be on the banking side. And then I also could do the investment stuff. So it was kind of interesting, kind of cool. Didn't really love that. But I was like, okay, but then I got recruited by Merrill Lynch. And I was like, this is awesome. So ended up starting with their 401k service team. And then I ended up working in uh, their global wealth management group um, under their separately managed accounts, basically working with high net worth clients. The average account was about $3 million. So that's kind of like what I was doing. Loved it, enjoyed it, everything, steak dinners, you know, going out to fancy restaurants. I mean, we were living the high life mm -hmm. and then the market crashed. Oh, <laughs> And it was just like, well, you know, that, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up getting um, laid off in March of 09, which is, you know, no surprise. Yeah. Um, no surprise at all. Um, that being said, um, I was kind of like, all right, well, you know, we'll, we'll figure this out. So I, I lived in the Philippines for about a month. Random, I know. Super, super random. Wanna, what's even more random? I'm half Filipino. That's dope. I was in Manila and then we, I was in Manila predominantly. And then I was, um, we went to Palawan. Oh, nice. Yep. So it was a really great, and we did the, um, we went to Bataan too. Like, yeah. That's where we were. And we went to a yeah. couple of different, like, oh, they were, um, what are they called? They're like, um, they were U.S. installations that were kind of converted. Or like um, Clark and, uh, uh, oh God, what's the second one? Subic Bay. Yes, yes, that's exactly where he went. So he went to those two. Very cool. Had an amazing time. Like just, I mean, the mangoes just <laughs> were um, just amazing. I've never had, I, and I never really liked mangoes because the ones we get in the States, and you can appreciate this, are very stringy. Oh, yeah. And they're just yeah. like, man. But the ones in the Philippines were so creamy and juicy. You're just like, well, I just want another and another oh, yeah. and another. And then I ran into a goat. And then there was <laughs> that. Was that. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so I, I really need to go back. It's been a very long time. But, <laughs> but then I started having my friends call. And this is kind of how the IV investors started. My friends were calling. They were transitioning out of their jobs. They were having kids. They were getting married. They were doing all these things. And they're like, Courtney, help me. You know, I'm going to cash out my retirement. No, you're not. You're going to roll it over. You know? <laughs> um, you know, like, we just having those kind of conversations. And they're like, well, yeah, I just started this really cool job. I have lots of benefits, but I have no idea what I'm doing. And what I realized is that there's a huge wealth, uh, like, like mess of education in terms of financial products like people just like i don't know the difference between a cd and a bond now a cd is a certificate of deposit and it's federal it's fdic insured and then you have a, a bond which is not but you know even understanding like they're like oh they both have interest rates right and i'm like well 
yeah, you're you're right, but there's there's this thing out there that that that's one's protected and the other one's not, and that, and if something goes left, the one that's not protected, you're gonna have a problem. And the thing is, and again, we in my lifetime, I never experienced like bank failures, but remember at the crash there were bank failures like all the time. Yep. So every time I turned around, I was like, they're like another one fell in California, and at first it was like far away. It was like, oh, California. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's California. You know, things happen about California. You know, and then it started getting closer. And like when Lehman fell, Lehman Brothers is a bond, um, is a bond house. It's basically a fixed income house. And I was like, and Lehman, we had Lehman portfolios on my desk. Oh and yeah. I was like, okay. I was like, you know, stuff got real. Um, and so that's kind of, but again, I was able to kind of impart that kind of conversation to people so, so they understand. I mean, it's one thing to read it in the book, but this next thing to experience it. So I was able to kind of create the blog and give people kind of like an overview. And I'm like, okay, now that you have this information, then we can come back and have a real conversation. And that's how the IB Investor started it. So, you know, six years later, I teach classes. I teach um, investing kind of stocks 101. I teach about REITs. I teach um, a little bit about mutual funds and ETFs. I don't love them, but I do understand that on the retirement side. And even those who are like, ah, I don't really feel comfortable, you know, picking stocks, but I know I need to be invested. That's kind of what they're thing is and it should be because we should all i think that what we all need to get out of this conversation is that we all should be investing yes just, that's it you know yep. and i was like well, this is and it was so we were purchased i don't know if you know what well, you probably know Merrill was purchased in september of 08 like and we didn't know like i was i remember driving in because i was with a client um that I think down in Delaware. So I'm driving in like into the office and they're like, yeah, Bank of America versus Merrill Lynch today. I was like, oh, okay. So I'm looking when I get to the office, I was like, I'll go to the office. I'll check my mail, my email. And I was like, um, okay, no. Okay. That's a client request. Okay. That's a client request. No announcement. Oh, okay. Another client. Off okay. I, mean, I was like, uh, somebody gonna let us know. <laughs> I, mean, I mean anyone just just the heads up like hey just so you know we were purchased <laughs> so yeah so i guess i'll i'll ask you um i'm so happy that you have a lot of experience in the financial world uh the stock boss up app that i you know i've co-founded with the rap snacks uh, foundation uh rap snacks is really passionate about getting everyone to invest, especially in the Afri African American community. They are very passionate about it. Um, I'm very impressed by them, actually. They, they really care a lot about it. Uh, the, you know, we, we're trying to, to demystify finances. So with that background, I'm, I'm really curious, can you tell me something about the financial world, like the inner stuff that happens in the financial world that maybe a normal person wouldn't know about? Hmm. Um, well, I guess unless you're a trader, we don't really, I never watched the market that much. I mean, we had our <laughs> word term, terminal up, but I really spent more time like on customer service issues, like than I did anything else. They're like, Hey, you know, you know, Mr. Smith is having problems with his understanding his statements. Yeah. Like, okay, where's his FA? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was basically the FA's FA. I was the <laughs> advisor. And I'm like, well, why are you guys calling me? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think those are the things that we're like always like boiler room is our thing. And I'm like, no, they stopped that a long time ago. You know, they, the churn and burn kind of the eighties kind of got rid of all of that. And I also think it's really cool is that everybody feels like we're all traders. I'm not a trader. And the thing is that they got away from trading, not, and, and they're like, and I noticed that it was a conversation like, yeah, traders aren't successful. And I was like, well, no, no, that's not actually really true. But what was happening is that at the time commissions were so high is that you could basically make money on an account by just trading it. So they were doing what's called churn and burn in the eighties. And I think maybe the early nineties. And they were like, you know, you can't do this anymore. Stop it. <laughs> you know, and they give you this, this kind of rationale. Like we used to have B shares and mutual funds. There used to be three classes of mutual funds. There was the A shares, which were you pay your fees up front. You had the B shares that you would pay the fees in the back. And then the C shares, which we call no load. And I don't know why they did it because it's not no load, it's level load, but okay. I mean, they changed the language finally, but still. I mean, but again, they got rid of B shares because they're like, hey, you guys are abusing them. And I'm like, 
no, I actually prefer B shares as opposed to A shares because over time, as long as you don't get out, it's called a contingent deferred sales charge. As long as you weren't getting out in the time period of the five, the five years, I think most were five, five or six years, as long as you weren't out in that time period, you, it actually worked out financially better. But what was going on is people were doing the B shares, selling them after three years. And then the uh, sales charge on the back end was super expensive. Yep. I'm like, okay, so a lot, so a lot of the things that um, that we don't have in the financial services industry are basically a result of like bad actors, and not like really bad actors, but just not misusing products. Yeah. Uh, even the, um, I actually got pulled on the auction rate securities issue that happened in the beginning of 08. Um, the the market, the auction rate market. So basically, they it's 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 it what we called it paper, you know. So it basically cleared every single week. So it, like you were, it's basically like think about it like as a short term debt. But then at the end of the week, it kind of reset because they would it was like they would clear the market. And what I mean by they, you know, there was either enough buyers and sellers like a regular market or a big you know a big fish. I mean, we'll call them from other lack of a better term like J.P. Morgan, Merrill. Somebody would step in and clear the market. Everybody was liquid. Everyone went home and they were holding hands singing kumbaya because their cash was getting something higher than what was available out in you know in the world in the cash cash management account. So everybody liked it. The FA liked it. The client liked it. But one day there weren't enough buyers and sellers. And you know what? All the big fish were over leveraged, how we started to know there was a problem, and then the market crashed. Now, on one side, if the market crashes, you get a better rate. So you're like, hey, the market crashed. I get a better rate, which is fine, but if you needed that money, they had to go to the secondary market. They were getting 70 cents on the dollar for cash. Speak of that, I mean, it was just like a disaster. That's what happened. Wow. I, I want to note something you said that, that I found the same issue not the same issue, but the same reality of, of fi the financial world, which is you're in sales most of the time. Um, I did portfolio management, but I wasn't the high priority person. The sales and the customer service was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people don't realize that, and you touched on it perfectly, so thank you for, for noting that. You know, one of the reasons why we did Stock Boss Up and all this, this app is to help people that, that really don't can't get help from maybe a financial advisor because of the amount of assets. This is a theory I have. Um, you know, if you want, if a fi what do financial advisors really want in a client? And will they take someone that makes 30K a year and 40K a year? No, I mean, because no. the way the incentives, the, it's, you're not, a, it's a disincentive. So what financial advisors want, and this is a conversation I had a lot with them, is because I, I you know, like I was their advisor. They wanted the they wanted a very they wanted a small client book with high AUM. AUM is assets under management. So they could have three or four clients, I'm being very honest, uh, three or four clients, or maybe max 10, but they had, you know, a million, a hundred million dollars in that under under management, they'd be quite happy. Yep. They would spend half of their day on, you know, the golf course or whatever fit their fancy. <laughs> um, but when you have more clients and you had, I mean, they become to a financial advisor, this has become very, um, burdensome and not in a burdensome way in terms of like more people are burdensome, but in terms of the resources that are required, um, it, it does become burdensome. And then it also becomes sometimes if you don't have a lot of assets under management, it just doesn't make financial sense. And that that's really what makes me sad about the financial industry is that instead of us educating, we're more concerned about what makes financial sense. And it's like, well, you know, but then those who are licensed, I'm not licensed anymore. I can say whatever I want. But those who are licensed and those who know, they can't say anything like on, in public. Like you, you have compliance issues. Yep. So it's like, darn, like, okay, it's, I can't say anything for free because of compliance. But once I'm in a relationship with a client, I have to, my client coming in the door has to have a certain amount of investable assets. At least with us, it was 250,000, which was like, like, hey, we're, and 250 was like, hey, we're doing you a favor, you know? Yeah. And so that being said is that a lot of, of people are cut out of that and that they need financial advising. Um, but it like, and that's why I didn't like being a financial advisor myself when I first started, because the people that I needed to work with, I wasn't getting fine. I wasn't financially being compensated for it. Yeah. And I was so upset about it. Yeah. And I was like, this isn't right. So I love like what Stock Boss Up is doing because it's like, hey, I'm going to make this stuff accessible to you so you can kind of put it in perspective and make it work. And yeah. it's like, you know, and I was telling somebody like we were talking about sectors. Sectors are different parts of the industry and, and sectors are important. 
I mean, the industry, I mean, the finding like the economy, I should say. And certain parts of the economy do well if the economy is doing well. Other parts of the economy, if the economy is not doing so well, they do well. So it's about understanding that. So people are like, yeah. And I was telling somebody, they utilities are considered um, defensive or like all kind of, but I was also saying, you know what? You know what I think is also defensive? And they were like, what? I said, telecom. And they were like, do you think so? I said, Yes, I think so. But it's a new, it's a new phenomenon because it wasn't always like that. Telecom seemed to be a luxury. But now that I have this, you know, I'm always connected to my Wi-Fi. I have my phone. I have my iPad. I have all of these bells and whistles and my iWatch, you know, my Apple Watch, excuse me, going off. Ding, 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 ding. Now this is more of a necessity. I can't tell you what's going on in my life without looking at my calendar, which yeah. is on my phone, which dings to tell me I have something going on. So I, I'm starting to see the telecom is actually not a, it's not going to be a cyclical, which is kind of something that goes up and down with the economy. It's not going to yeah. be cyclical anymore. It's and I mean, especially the way they're doing this 5G rollout, you know, we're going to start seeing this more and more and it's starting to integrate in our lives in a way that utilities, you know, did. And so I think I, that's why I really am like, mm. and utilities are still important. And I, and I don't, but I think there's kind of like utilities plus this stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Courtney, for talking to me. Uh, um, check out the Ivy investor, uh, Courtney, thank, thank you so much. You're, you're such a breadth of knowledge, and I look forward to us talking again. Um, thank I do you too. so much. Thank you. Have a great one.